Good evening, friends. It's a bittersweet moment for us because tonight is the final event of our virtual residency. It's hard to really articulate what this residency has been for us, how meaningful it's been, and how it's been such a treat getting to know you better and sharing music that we love in ways that kind of goes above and beyond the norm of what a traditional classical music event would look like. Tonight's purpose is case of saving the best for last, or at least saving our favorite for last. When we applied for this grant from Chamber Music America last year, the proposal for music in the that we would all be situated in the auditorium around circular tables. Everybody would be invited to bring an object that was meaningful to them, which would rest at the center of the table, and in between our performances, things and stuff and nostalgia, we get to go around the table sharing what that momento meant to us and so our table mates would get to, to share in that experience. And tell you how excited we were for that event and I still love the idea so much and wish we could have planned our sharing session in that way. But as is the theme with COVID times, we flex and adapt and we're doing the best we can to make lemonade out of what I think is a lemonless situation. <laughs> As a reminder, have your program booklet handy so you can follow along with the text. And because we are wrapping up today's concert with a sing-along from home. So we want to hear you all the way from our remote Zoom location, singing loud and proud to these suffrage songs compiled by Steve Woodbury. If you don't have your program, you can download a copy at www.whistlinghens.com slash CMA. It's going to be a lot of fun. In tonight's program, we'll be singing about how we attribute value to otherwise invaluable things by way of associated memories, events, words, and experiences. Our opening piece really speaks to this theme as it goes through numerous items that we as society gave human descriptors. The text says, what happened is, we grew lonely living among the things. And it goes on to say, so we gave the clock a face, the chair a back, the bottle a long slender neck, and so on. It sets the stage for touching stories you'll hear from several Collingtonians. This piece is called Things. It's written by Gwyneth Walker and is actually extracted from a larger work called The Laughter of Women, which is written for soprano, clarinet, and piano but this movement is for duo only.
most things are handmade and personal, like this really beautiful memento contributed by Maya Keach. Hello, my name is Maya Keach, and this is my memento. This is a watercolor that was done by my grandmother, uh, who was from Sweden, she was an immigrant, and the, she did it in 1921, and it's a picture of my mother playing the piano. And um, my mother was born in 1907, and so this, uh, I think, is a beautiful picture. She um, was taking correspondence courses in art and living in uh, central Missouri, and, um, but I think, and this is one of her assignments, apparently. But I'd say it's very successful. Now, my mother at the time was very upset because the curtains weren't hung in the window. But, <laughs> but it's a much better picture without the curtains, of course. And um, that's, you know, I don't know what else I could say about it except that it's one of my favorite things. I love this painting. And my daughter does, too. And some things are given to us. We're going to hear from Heather Hike about a memento given to one of her family members to prepare for her marriage, followed by a movement from Rebecca Clark's Three Old English Songs, which talks about a man professing his love for Phyllis and unveiling the wedding ring he selected for her. One of the major experiences for most women was marriage, which had its own customs and its own expectations, which have changed considerably over the decades. Here we have a 1950s American Bride by Daniels and Fisher in Denver, which tells you the proper kinds of gloves to wear for different kinds of weddings, and has page after page of instructions for the bride. The focus is on the wedding itself much more than the marriage. Today, we try to focus a little bit more on the marriage. The second object that I have was made in 1811. Like so many objects of women, we, and in this case, a girl, we don't know who the person was. But we can see how she worked very hard at her sampler. This is a quite simple one. She was both mastering sewing, which was a crucial skill, and her alphabet, and showing that she was a proper young lady ready to start to move to form her own household. By studying the linen it's sewn on and the thread and the letters, we can learn about who this person was even if we don't know her name. One of the great demands for women was not only education and access to money, but also access to professions. Here I'm symbolizing that by a hard hat that I once wore and that shows us one of the professions that women can now do that once was impossible to do. So we think about these different things and we think about all the incredible roles women have played, including quilts and writing. American history without fully including all women is distorted history. So next time when you see an object, maybe you have something from your aunt or your grandmother Look at it carefully. Did she make it? How did she get it? Was it a gift? And ask your questions about that object and what it tells us about her life and their lives. And think about the ways that their lives were so different, lives without plumbing or electricity, lives without reliable birth control, lives without higher education, and ways that our lives are so similar.
Some things are treasured heirlooms. A few weeks ago, Margaret Bagley shared the story of inheriting a wooden chest after the death of her parents. In the bottom of the chest was a wooden purse with a collection of letters tied together with ribbon. These were letters from her grandfather to her grandmother documenting their courtship and family life, which ended up being somewhat difficult. Margaret said that she was fascinated by what the letters said, but also wondered about the details that were not in the letters. She has since written a novel based on these letters from these characters. So in this, we're going to hear about some pictures in this trunk, and then in the following song, we'll hear a woman giving very specific instructions as to what kind of man is allowed to write letters to her, and who just, you know, walk right on by. <laughs> Um, my name's Margaret Bagley. I'm going to talk about uh, two very important women in history, at least history in my family. Uh, the first is my great-grandmother. Her name was Eliza Dunnigan, and she um, came west with a handcart company with a, joining the Mormon Church. She was about 19 years old. And um, she walked a good deal of the way. And on the way, she helped with um, birthing babies, as they termed it. And um, thereafter in her life, she decided she would be a midwife. So after she got to the Salt Lake Valley, she had this picture taken. And the young man on her lap is my grandfather. Now. I never knew my grandfather. He was born in 1868, and he died in 1907. But this is as she started her life in Salt Lake after coming west. Now, as this child got a little bit older, he met a young woman in school. They were, they were class sweethearts. They exchanged a lot of letters back and forth, back, back and forth. And this is the way he looked when he entered West Point. Now, he only went there one year. I'm sorry to say he did flunk out. But if he hadn't flunked out, he would not have been able to marry my grandmother, this sort of surly looking woman. They made a good pair. They got married. And they had five children. Now, sad to relate, after their marriage in 1890, by 1898, two of the children had died from scarlet fever. That was not uncommon at all. On a lighter note, this is my grandmother's purse. I handle it with care. I am assured that she bought this in approximately 1890 in a store in Salt Lake. Inside, there were letters, many, many letters. In fact, I based a book on the letters. Inside also is sort of a little, a little wallet made out of kid, and inside of that are samples of all five of her children's hair curls. This was very common for women to do. So I'm very glad I have that. Now, this young woman who started out as a midwife in Salt Lake, she just kept right on going. She was born in 1850. She was still going in the very early, early part of the 19th century. She was still working. And I've seen the county records. Her name is very prominent. She did a lot of deliveries, a lot of deliveries, even that late. I have one more photograph of her, and she's, she's even older. So she must have been what we might call a pretty tough cookie. Now, my grandmother, I knew well. She lived with us, and I knew her until she died in 1955. I was about 15. So I heard a lot of stories about her life with my grandfather 
a man I never knew. So the letters taught me a lot about that grandparent that I never knew. And having that picture of him really stays, stays with me. And it stayed with me as I wrote the story, somewhat fictionalized of what their life might have been. Consumerism, pop culture, and arbitrary social constructs have often dictated how women portray themselves, how they interact with others, and what they choose to do. We think a lot about how the media presents women in ads and music videos, almost always for the purpose of sexualizing women. Take a look at some of these real ads. It's embarrassing how modern many of them are. Could you imagine if the genders were reversed in these? What would you think? And why would that be the thought that popped into your brain? Geez, <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's definitely not how I eat burgers. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen the damage these offensive portrayals can do. They reduce women to the value of their looks. They normalize violence and abuse against women by sending a visual message that women are basically only as valuable as everyday objects. They're not even human. In the next clip, You'll get to hear from Jeannie Besmer about a memento that takes a magazine cover, something that historically distills the value of a woman down to her physical attractiveness, and reinvents it in a way that honors one woman's accomplishments, intellect, and spirit of goodwill. So it is possible to use advertising and marketing to celebrate women. We just have to do better as a society, recognizing the problem and actively working to change how women are portrayed. This is Jeannie Besmer, and my memento 
is this Life magazine of my grandmother. She is my maternal grandmother, Elsie Cohn Rao, who was a suffragette and a founder of the League of Women Voters in Missouri. This is a mock-up, of course, of Life magazine, designed and executed by my father in 1951 to honor her on the occasion of her 70th birthday at a gala affair. We grandchildren stood at the front door and handed these Life magazines to each guest as they came in. I was eight at the time. In Jefferson City, Missouri's capital, there's a plaque that reads the following. This tablet is a tribute to those women in Missouri whose courageous work opened the opportunities of complete citizenship to all women in the state. Elsie Rao is among them with her cousin and dear friend, Edna Gellhorn. And in contrast, We'll now perform a fixture by Beth Wyman, which is about women shopping. These are fancy, well-dressed women that are buying into consumerism and pop culture. And at the end, we conclude that the solitary nun is actually the best dressed of them all in her plain black robes because she is being her authentic self. <laughs> are coming to a close, but we're going to end on a literal and figurative high note. Now's the time to grab your program booklet so you have the words to our sing-along from home tunes. In a little bit, we'll hear from Steve Woodbury about the background of this song collection. But first, we're going to hear from residents Mary Lou Shearer, Ruth Schrock, and Natalie Groom about mementos that empowered them. I'm Mary Lou. Pittman Sharer. And my memento is a fabulous little book that my sister, 
her daughter and her granddaughter compiled stories from our great grandmothers. This is under the story of my fourth great grandmother, whose name was Claudia Eliza Bennett Bissell. And this in particular is a story about her grandparents, whose names were Anna Hayes Warnock and Thomas Bennett Sr. Anna lived in Charleston, South Carolina, and was a heroine of the American Revolution. When the British took over Charleston, which was then known as Charlestown, the year was 1780 and Anna was 28 years old. She had already married her husband Thomas and was stationed on James Island fighting for our independence. It was hard to travel anywhere in those days because of the war. People had to get permission from the British soldiers just to go across town. So Anna, getting to James Island was quite a feat. Anna told the soldiers that her husband was sick and needed her to nurse him back to health. Soldiers in those days were gentlemen first, fighters second, and they took pity on Anna and said she could go. The surprising thing was that they volunteered to row her across the river. Now, Thomas wasn't really sick. He had sent word to Anna that the American troops needed more gunpowder. Their supply was running low. Anna sewed as much gunpowder in her long, full skirt as she could carry. She also carried some bandages and nursing supplies to fool the soldiers. Anna and several soldiers started across the river in a rowboat. A little way out, one of the soldiers started smoking. Knowing how dangerous this could be around all the gunpowder, Anna pretended to be sick. The soldiers, being gentlemen, quit smoking. Anna and the gunpowder made it safely across to the American soldiers on James Island. Greetings, this is Ruth Schrock. Uh, my memento is a photo collage I did sometime in the late 70s. The influences of the leaders of the feminist movement, such as Gloria Steinman of Ms. Magazine, Betty Friedan of the Feminine Mystique, as well as Phyllis Schafle in opposition to them were still around. This photo collage, which I titled Beyond the Flower, was a personal artistic response to these movements. The colorful flowers represent all the expected milestones I had reached. A college education, a first job as a psychiatric nurse, a trip to Europe, a marriage, and the birth of two sons. While I enjoyed the years of homemaking and child care, there was the feeling of, is this all? Which is represented by the mysterious face in the background. This mystery led me to the completion of a fine arts major and eventually to a career in interior design. On a personal note, I will say that having lived here for almost a year now, I am constantly inspired by the strong and empowered women here. Your history inspires me, the work you've done to advance the rights of women really around the world inspires me, your stories inspire me, and I thank you for being the change makers in the world that influenced generations of women trickling all the way down to me. Hello, this is Natalie Groom, and my memento is this little magnet. On this magnet, there's a picture of an older woman. She's at a protest, and her sign says, I can't believe I still have to protest this effing stuff, let's say. Um, one of my friends gave this to me as a gift 
uh, I think for Christmas or my birthday, and it was around the time of the first Women's March in Tucson, Arizona. I was not particularly politically active up till about 2016 with the, the latest presidential candidacy run. And that year, everything changed for me because I realized that there were so many things I had taken for granted, believing that certain rights for women, immigrants, or the LGBT community had been acquired and would be sustainable in the future. To me, I thought somebody's already fought for these rights. This is great. We can move forward with the next thing. What can I do? But I realized with with just one administration, all of those things could go away. I didn't even know legally something like Roe versus Wade could potentially go away. All of those things terrified me, honestly terrified me. And it galvanized me in a way to make sure that I was very politically active and informed and making sure that I was actively doing things to promote the voices of women, immigrants, um, the LGBTQ community, and making sure that I, that my work as a musician also translated into that sphere. At the time, I, in 2017, I was honestly debating giving up music as a career because I felt like if I spend three or four hours in a, in a room every day practicing, who does that really directly benefit? I just felt restless, like I needed to do something more. And I thought maybe I should just quit and spend all my time volunteering with Emily's List or The Trevor Project or Planned Parenthood or somebody that I knew was helping um, protect the rights of people that had been worked for so hard by, by, by women like this. So this, this magnet, even though it's kind of funny and silly, it's also a reminder to me to first of all, never take for granted the hard work that people before me have done, but also to make sure that I don't get complicit in the situation and never be in a position where I'm not informed about what's going on because like in an instant, all of these rights that I thought I had could be taken away. I'm Steve Woodbury. I've been singing folk songs most of my life and Grew up learning songs from the civil rights movement and the labor movement and the anti-war movement and realized how important these were to these social movements. I got interested in songs from the social movements of the 19th century. Those aren't sung so much nowadays but I know there were lots of them. There were songs in the abolitionist movement, in the temperance movement, and in the suffrage movement. So for the centennial of the 19th Amendment this year, I decided to put together a collection of songs from the women's suffrage movement. There were all kinds of songs written, some with composed words and music, but a lot with new words to familiar tunes. This was a very common practice in the 19th century for political campaigns, for social movements, during the Civil War. It's still common today and we'll find new songs being written about the pandemic and COVID-19 and using Zoom, all written to familiar tunes. So I started looking, and there has been some research in this area, uh, found a lot of things now on the internet that were not collected, and was able to put together a spreadsheet of 150 or so different lyrics from the suffrage movement. I picked about 40 of those for a songster let us sing as we go, votes for women. This is intended for group singing, which is another interest of mine. Get people together and sing and learn some history at the same time. Unfortunately, our scheduled programs during Women's History Month got uh, postponed, but we will sing these together someday soon. 
Thank you, Steve. And now it's your turn to sing. We're going to sing some of the songs that are found in the Suffrage Songster. And we're going to start with a tune that I know you know. It is Maryland, My Maryland. But if you listened to June this with Natalie, then you would have already sung this as O Christmas Tree or O Tannenbaum. So this is Perfect 36, sung to the tune of Maryland, My Maryland. Right, so how this is gonna work is we're gonna play through the tune once with me playing clarinet so that you can hear the tune and Jennifer at the piano. Um, and then the second time through, we're gonna sing the verse that's in your booklet. So if you'll open up your booklet, this is towards the end in the Music and Mementos program, so you can follow along with the text there. Um, as you might expect, I am not a professional singer like Jennifer, so you'll get to hear my beautiful singing tones. And Jennifer is not a professional pianist, but she has graciously agreed to learn the piano part for these so we could still bring it to you, even though we're in quarantine and we have to do a virtual residency. So I hope you enjoy our little jam session of suffrage songs, starting with what I think of as O oh Christmas Tree, O oh Christmas Tree, but this is Perfect 36 in your handbook.
your packet. It's called Keep Woman in Her Sphere, and it's set to the tune of Auld Lang Syne. And I love the text to this one because it, it goes through, um, the first two verses are men saying, we should really keep women in her sphere. I taught my wife how to stay in her place. And then at the end, she says, I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago, and he says, women's rights are just the same as mine. Let woman choose her sphere. Amen to that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
By now you've all figured out why I play the clarinet instead of sing, but you know, I'm happy to gift you, gift you that, um, to re-watch forever whenever you're feeling down and out, if you want to listen to me sing. <laughs> So, and you can hear me play piano right along with her singing, <laughs> so it should make me quite happy. Okay. So we'll end with The New America. So find that in your, in your program booklet, The New America. And it's set to the tune of My Country, Tis a Thief, or also known as just America. And um, we're ending with the thought that women are free. We still have a lot of work to do, and I know so many of you are so active in the political community here. You're wonderful advocates, and I mean, the fact that we even have a compilation like this that Collington was gonna have a sing-along for and celebrate, I think, speaks to our values here, and I thank you for that. Shall we? Let's do it. tuning in. Have a great night. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight and really for all the other events we did the past two weeks. We're so glad that you sang along tonight. I feel like we could hear you from our homes <laughs> and we hope that this whole residency was special to you because you are special to us. We were both really moved and inspired by your stories and we thank all of you for sharing these moments with us. Yeah, I think when it comes down to it, there's really no way around it that things have been really tough for everyone the last few months. I know around the country and around the world, people are feeling depressed, afraid, anxious, and just this whole other basket of negative emotions. If they're being isolated, not knowing what holes, it's hard not being able to see each other. I'm seeing you. Um, it's hard having to accept that we, aren't, we weren't going to be able to get to do this presidency for you. But we hope you feel uplifted and encouraged. Please, please, please keep in contact with us. Let us know how you're doing. Fill out one of our event surveys if you want to talk about the youth making residency specifically. But reach out if you're feeling isolated because more than anything, we want you to feel loved, valued, and supported.
And then he says, we have us to share cute pictures of your cat or funny stories you've read in the newspaper. And we just want to thank you for everything and tell you that we are thinking of you. So have a good night. Love you. Bye.